Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our 2024 complimentary webinar series covering the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations. We are coming to you live today from Washington, D.C., and we're so glad you all could make it. Okay, so a bit about this series. As usual, all of our webinars are complimentary and recorded. The FAR has 52 total parts and we will run through them sequentially each week on Wednesdays and Fridays at noon Eastern time. The recordings and PowerPoints will be posted within 24 hours of the webinar ending. You can find the recordings on our YouTube channel simply by subscribing to it using the link you see on the screen. There is no cost. You can find the PowerPoint on the SlideShare site using your LinkedIn credentials to log in. Again, there is no cost. We also offer sponsorship opportunities. If you are interested, please send us an email to hello at jennifershouse.com. And now for how to sign up to the series. Unfortunately, there is no bulk registration and you must register individually for each webinar. If you go to the Jennifer Schaus website, navigate to the section called the FAR and you'll find the individual registration links. Also, the recording links will be posted here upon the completion of each webinar. Please note that we covered the FAR in 2020, so if you are eager to get a jump start, please find these historical recordings on our site. You can navigate to the webinars tab and scroll down to the section the FAR 2020. Please note that because it has been four years, many of the regulations have changed and been updated, so please use this as a reference tool only. Okay, now a bit about us. We work with established federal contractors worldwide, helping them to navigate the market. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. Some of the contract vehicles we support are listed here on your screen. For more information, please visit our website. Okay, and those were our services for federal contractors. We also provide marketing and advertising services for organizations who are selling to federal contractors. We can add the extra muscle to your marketing efforts via our newsletter ads and webinar sponsorship to in-person events. Please email us and ask for a media kit. We are currently offering a discounted offer in our newsletter, which reaches over 33,000 subscribers. If you want to place an order or have any questions, please send us an email to hello at jenniferschaus.com. Contract vehicles can be great marketing tools for federal business. Current open solicitations include Navy Seaport, Next Generation, and NASA, as well as GSA Alliant. Additionally, the GSA Multiple Award Schedule is an open enrolling RFP. If you qualify for any of these and need proposal support, please email us for a quote. As you know, congressional hearings on both the House of Representatives and on the Senate side are open to the public unless otherwise stated. We have a list here of the upcoming schedule, including the date, time, building, and room numbers. Most meetings take place in the Dirksen, Rayburn, or Cannon buildings. If you are selling to any of these departments or agencies, attending the hearings can be a great way to gather information, understand the process, and also network with influencers. Please join us for these upcoming complimentary webinars with various APEX accelerators. Jennifer will be covering GSA schedules as well as federal marketing for a local Apex Accelerator in Virginia. These are complimentary and online webinars, so please join us. Jennifer will also be teaching two classes for the Maryland Apex Accelerator, one on marketing and one on GSA schedules. These are in July and in December and once again, complimentary. Our webinars are complimentary thanks to our longtime and generous corporate and in-kind sponsors. Please allow me to introduce them. We would like to thank our friends at GovEvents, the premier platform for posting events related to government and government contracting. You can find all of our webinars and our events at GovEvents.com, as well as recordings from our past 600 plus webinars. We also want to thank Tom Johnson and his team at Set Aside Alert, the go-to publication for contracting opportunities for small, woman-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and 8 day firms. Visit SetAsideAlert.com for more information. The Fairfax Economic Development Authority has an online calendar of events and webinars. We want to thank them for posting our events and webinars on their calendar. The Virginia Apex Accelerator at George Mason University offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to establish government contracting firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. If you are interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore their services, review homework recommendations, register for live training, and find useful links to agencies and other self-directed learning. One-on-one, -on -one, counseling is limited to eligible client companies. Appointment requests are handled in the order they were received and based on counselor availability due to high demand. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. Join the Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce's monthly GovCon Council meeting to network with peers, learn about upcoming events and opportunities, and help to shape future programming. The meetings take place the fourth Tuesday of each month at 8.30 a.m. at the Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce. The next meeting will be on July 23rd. 
Do you want help winning government contracts? Bitsby can help. Users can find contract opportunities from federal, state, and local government. Additionally, you can search for teaming partners, incumbent point of contact, expiring contracts, compliance matrices, and also proposal templates. Create your login today at bitsby.com. Bitspeed is an official partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration's E2G Empower to Grow program. Events are the ultimate engagement channel to bring government and industry together. 68% of government personnel report that they attend more than one event each year. The Federal Business Council, or FBC, has worked with government and industry for 45 plus years to create gatherings where ideas are shared and to help government achieve its goals. This includes agency industry days, cybersecurity symposiums, technology expos, and offsite meetings. FBC provides full life cycle meeting planning and event management. With over 5,000 meetings under their belt, FBC has the experience, systems, and personnel to make your next event exceptional. Learn more at www.fbcinc.com. Now, last but not least, please check out our friends over at GovBrew. GovBrew is the most read GovCon newsletter, keeping thousands of GovCon professionals in the loop with news, updates, and opportunities in the federal contracting market, all in a fun and accessible email that only takes five minutes to read, and it's 100% free to join. It goes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m., and it's filled with great content, event postings, webinars, and more. We encourage you to sign up at govbrew.co, or you can use the QR code you see on the screen. And the reason we're all here today is to cover FAR Part 45. Okay, let's meet today's speaker. Please welcome Susan Warshaw Ebner to the webinar. Susan, we're so glad to have you with us today and are excited to hear your presentation. I'll put myself on mute now and hand the floor over to you. Thanks, Emma, I appreciate it. So I'm Susan Warshaw Ebner, and I chair the Government Contracts and Investigations Practice at Stinson LLP. I have extensive experience handling bid protests, small business size protests and appeals, contract administration and compliance program issues, strategic alliances, security, suspension debarment, audits, investigations, requests for equitable adjustment claims, and formal and informal dispute resolution. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call me. You can also find me on my website at stinson.com. Next slide, please. So we're here today to talk about government property, and this is what we're going to be trying to cover today, purpose and policy. I'll go over some key definitions. There are many, but we will really focus on just a few. Property management, what is it really, and how do you use government contract? government property in a contract, and how do you administer the handling of government property and certain clauses, and then some takeaways. Next slide. So what is government property and why do we use it? So government property, it, the policies and procedures of FAR Port 45 are the ones that talk about like, how is government property used by contractors and management? What do you have to do to use it, report it, and how do you redistribute it or dispose of it at the end of a contract? Next slide. Some of the key definitions are what is government property, as you can see on the screen. It's all kinds of property that are owned or leased by the government. It can include both government furnished property, which you know we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, but that's the property that they specifically give you in a contract, and the government is responsible for providing you suitable, adequate, and sufficient uh, amounts of it. Um, as well as things like contractor acquired property where you have a contract, you have to buy different kinds of materials and supplies, and that all becomes government acquired property if it's left over from what you're actually delivering. For purposes of FAR Part 45, government property is not software, it's not IP, it's not real property, uh, and it's not things that have liens. So it is stuff that is actually identified as government property in the contract for performance of the contract. If you go to a government site and they say, here's an office and there are chairs and desks, things that are there that are ancillary, those aren't traditionally viewed as government property. However, if they gave you a locked office and they said, you're responsible for this office, only you have the key, and you're doing it for performance of a government contract, you may very well find that that could be considered government property. Next slide. So other definitions, contractor acquired property, contractor inventory, you'll get these slides and you can go through them. The one I wanna focus on is government furnished property and that is property in the possession of or directly acquired by the government and subsequently furnished to the contractor for performance of a contract. It can include spares, it can include property furnished for repair and maintenance. Let's say you have a contract to you know, do lawn mowing services and the government provides you with the lawn mowers. 
that could be government furnished property and it has to be in a position and capable of doing the job. So if they give you government property, it has to be suitable for the purpose for which it's being provided. They have to give it to you adequate, adequate amounts of it and have to give it to you timely so that it's suitable for the intended purpose. But regular government property aside from that doesn't have to meet all of those requirements. Next slide. Material, again, that's property that's consumed or expended in the performance of a contract. It does, it's not equipment. It's not special tooling. It's like I'm buying a whole batch of something, you know, and then you're taking it and using it in the performance. And so when you buy that property, that may very well trigger who owns the property if it's government property and the government pays for it, it then may become the government's property. Um, if it isn't something that the government pays for until after you deliver it, it may not be that government property until after there's been payment for it. Uh, production scrap is another thing that you should be noting. Uh, that is, quote, unusable material resulting from production, engineering, operations, maintenance, repair, et cetera. Interestingly, though, it still may be something that has value, such as things that are remelted. So let's say you've got metal sheets and you're cutting out the metal pieces that you need for performance, and there are leftover clippings that drop to the floor. Those things could be picked up, and those things might be production scrap, and they still have to be accounted for just like other government property until the end of the contract. Uh, property administrator is someone from the government and they are an authorized representative of the contracting officer and they're the ones who are going to dictate if you are a contractor on a contract with government property exactly what you have to do to address the government property and they're the people to report to with all the different forms that have to be filled out and things that have to be tracked during the life of the contract. <clears throat> Next slide. So key policies for this government property provision. Contractors, typically you're being paid a price and you're ordinarily required to furnish all the things that are necessary to perform that government contract. But in some cases, they decide they're gonna provide you government property. And clearly here in FAR 45, it says that kind of property is where it's in the government's best interest there's an overall benefit that outweighs the increased cost of administration and ultimately the property disposal. And it's something that's not going to substantially increase the government's assumption of risk and the government requirements can't otherwise be met. So you'll find there's government property where those things are uh, the key things that occur. Uh, just the fact that you're a contractor and you're at, you would rather have the government give you something doesn't make it something the government's likely to give you government property on. It's got to be something where the government's decided it's in their best interest to do so. Next slide. So generally speaking, when you're given government property, the contractor is not liable for its loss. You know, whether it's a cost reimbursement, time materials, or other kind of contract, typically the government assumes the risk that the government property, you know, if it's lost or stolen or whatever, they assume that risk. It's not the contractor's responsibility. However, that assumption of risk could be revoked where they find that the contractor lacks appropriate property management practices. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides, that contractors must have an appropriate property management system and they have to be complying with it. So the government might revoke um, this assumption of the liability for something that might happen to the government property if the contractor doesn't comply with its contractual requirements. As a prime contractor, you may find yourself in a position where you need to send government property to a subcontractor to do the job at all times. However, you are going to remain responsible for that government property, so you're going to want to make sure that the subcontractor is handling it the right way. In the event that there is loss of government property, um, the contracting officer in consultation with the property administrator, who we talked about in the definition section, will be deciding how are they going to handle this loss of government property? Has the government assumption of risk been waived? 
is the contractor going to be liable and what's the appropriate form and method for the government to recover for that loss. Any monies that are received as a result of the recoupment of monies for loss of government property are going to go to the Treasury Department unless a statute authorizes the money to go somewhere else. As you know, color of money is everything and money needs to be accounted for the right way. Next slide. So property management FAR 45.105 addresses all of the requirements for a contractor's property management system. Contractors are required to have policies, procedures, and practices. If you were a cast-covered contractor, for example, you would know that you would have to have material management and control systems to be you know, deemed you know, under the audits that occur for your um, DCMA audits when you're a contractor. This is the same kind of property management system. You're not necessarily going to be required to have a different system, but your system has to be one that is going to allow for the proper accounting for tracking management and control of government property. <clears throat> In the government contract, where you're given government property, the contracting officer or the property management officer that's been assigned is going to be analyzing whether or not you have a sufficient um, management system in place. If you have an approved management system, um, you're going to be able to get this government property and use it, track it, trace it, etc. If when they're reviewing this, they find that there are deficiencies in your system, and again, they may be auditing you during the life of the contract, so really important to continue to maintain your property management system properly. If there are going to be changes, something you want to work with the contracting officer and property administrator for so that you don't find that you're going to be noticed that you have a deficiency. Where you have a deficiency, you have to promptly address the deficiencies. If you don't address the deficiencies, it could result in that transfer of government assumption of risk. It could result in other issues as well, and it could even result in an adverse CPAR if you're not uh, properly handling government property under your contract. A CPAR, by the way, for those that don't know it, is a contractor performance and appraisal system process where at the end of each year for contracts a year or more, the government will be rating your performance. And for future contracting, they will look at these CPAR ratings. Contracting officers are required to look at those ratings when making decisions as to whether or not to award a contract to you. So you don't want to get an adverse CPAR. If you do get an adverse um, notice that you're going to have an adverse action, you really want to jump on that and properly handle that. Next slide. Transferring accountability. So as I mentioned before, sometimes, you know, we get this government property and you have to transfer it to a subcontractor. It always has to be tracked. In addition, sometimes you get government property on one contract and then it and then there's remaining government property. Remember, we talked about the material that was left over that you had bought for the performance of the contract, charged the government for, but you didn't need to use all of it in that project. <clears throat> that co property might very well be transferred to another contract. Uh, additionally, sometimes what happens is you have government property and you go and you're working on the government property and let's say you're doing a deliverable and the deliverable is you know, like a widget. And then the widget is something that the government wants to use in another contract that you or somebody else has um, and so they want to transfer the property. This is where 45106 comes into effect as well. When you transfer it, there are protocols that you have to apply, forms that you have to fill out, and you must document all the transfers, both the gaining and the losing contracts, to make sure that everybody knows what happened to this government property, where did it go, who got it, and how much did they get. Sometimes you will have a contract where you have hundreds of widgets, and you have to transfer those widgets to another contract. When you go to account for it, you may find instead of 100 widgets, you only have 99. You have to account for the numbers. So if there's something missing, it's got to be tracked. It's got to be identified as a lost or missing or stolen widget. And there'll be an accounting for that. So you really need to be 
very closely watching all of these things. Can't just stick it in the corner and say, okay, it's there. Oh, where is it? I got to find it. You've really got to be tracking this stuff very carefully. Typically, once you've transferred the government property to another contract that's required for that contract's performance, that can become government furnished property. And as I said before, government furnished property has to be adequate for the purpose intended, has to be in a suitable condition, and there have to be timely and sufficient amounts of it. But if it's your government property on one contract and you're moving it to another contract that you have, <clears throat> that kind of government furnished property requirement that the government would undertake and be responsible for, it's not going to apply to you, that contract. So government property is going to become government furnished property where it goes to a gaining contract that's not your continuing contract, but it's going to be somebody else's contract. And there, they'll then the government will then take responsibility for providing the government furnished property suitably, adequately, and sufficient quantities. Um, next slide. <clears throat> So solicitation and evaluation. So let's say you're going to bid on a contract and you get a solicitation and you have government property and you want to use it in the performance of that government contract. So as part of your offer, you'll have to specify the government property that you're going to be using. They are required under the clause to account for that use so that you don't get an unfair competitive advantage that could result in an offer getting selected because they had the government property. In other words, you still have to have a level playing field that you're offering to use it. It's something the government already has paid for anyway. They don't want you to get an unfair competitive advantage because you're now going to be able to use that stuff for this next procurement. So the evaluation will typically include an adjustment of the offer for evaluation purposes only of what is the equivalent rental value for purposes of evaluation. And there's actually a clause FAR 52-245-9, which goes into detail on this. Next slide. So government property is usually provided rent free. Again, the government has paid for it, they're not going to charge the contractor where the contractor is going to use it for a government contract. However, there are times when government property could be equipment, for example. It could be something there that you could use for commercial purposes. And where you're going to use it for a non-government commercial purpose or some other purpose that's not for the government, they may actually charge you a rental charge for using that. Um, the head of the contracting activity, the HCA, has to approve that use if the use is going to exceed 25% of the total government commercial combined use. So if 25% or more of that use is going to be for non-government purposes, you're likely to get charged a rental fee. They may not charge you a rental fee, especially if you're a nonprofit, but they may very well charge you one. Um, if you're going to use it for purely commercial purposes. But small businesses doing research and development or large businesses doing research and development, nonprofits, educational work, et cetera, where it's in the national interest, where there's not a direct benefit to a profit-making organization, but it's for a public purpose, they may not assess a rental charge at that point. Um, a lot of discretion here, as you're probably seeing, in terms of whether or not the government's going to assess you and how they're going to assess you. Where a contractor would use government property in another contract, as I mentioned before, if it's a fixed price contract, the contracting officer is going to want to get a fair rental or consideration for the use of the government contract property. You know, why is that? So like cost reimbursement, they're not going to charge you any rental fee, but they are going to want to assess it because in the fixed price contract, you're, 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 you're basing your contract fee on the total, which may include using the government property, and they want to make sure you're not going to charge the government for the cost of that government property. And that's really what that point is. The government doesn't want to get charged twice for what it's already bought, right? If it's already bought, it shouldn't get charged for it. So if it's included in the fixed price contract, they want to make sure that that charge isn't going to be in there for the government, that that's going to be deducted. Um, 
IR&D, independent research and development. This is something where you can use this property for IRAD, but very much it may be something where they charge a rental fee if you're going to do your IRAD for both commercial work as well as government work. So something to be thinking about. This is an area where it does get a little bit complicated. Your accounting for this has to be pristine. Your material management and control of this has to be pristine. So if you're going to do these things, um, make sure that you have a plan and you're carrying this out and you're tracking everything the right way. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we mentioned before, the government may have government property. Uh, it retains title to the property until it's otherwise disposed of at the end of the contract um, or if there's an earlier disposition. The government gets title when the contractor acquires or fabricates the property and it charges you. So unless the contract says, for example, you know, you're going to buy this property and title immediately is going to go to the government, you know, the title will retain, will be retained by the contractor until such time as the government pays for it, unless the contract provides otherwise. During the entire time, whether the contractor owns it or the government has rights in it, the property has to be properly accounted for throughout this entire property pro process. Um, unless it's going to be delivered. Once it's delivered, then again, you're filling out the forms, you're delivering the items to the government, it goes off of your government property tracking and control, goes into the hands of the government. At that point, the government is responsible. If you retain control of that, even after the government has accepted and paid for it, then it's still something you have to track and maintain control of. A government contract has a property administrator. The property administrator is going to evaluate the management of your property during the life of it. And again, if they find deficiencies, you're going to have to address that because the matter will be referred to the contracting officer and um, they could assess you uh, as well as take other actions against you if they find you're not properly handling this. Now, if the contracting officer issues a finding that in fact you have a deficiency or you've done something wrong with this government property, you will have a right to challenge it. That's a due process right. I would not ignore it. Uh, very serious, again, it could have impacts on the CPAR, it could have impacts in the acceptance, termination, or payment under a government contract. So really pay attention to that. Next slide. So title to government property. So again, we've got this, this kind of spectrum where we start off, we get a government contract, it's contractor go, buy this equipment, material, whatever, it becomes government property. We use it during the life of the property. And then at the end of the contract, the question is, what do you do with this stuff? And there are very clear rules on how you address this. Part of it is contract is approaching its end or you've got a termination for convenience or termination for default notice, whatever it happens to be. Hopefully, it's the end of the contract. You've successfully performed. You prepare an inventory disposal schedule. That's a listing of all the property, where it is, how much it is, the condition, et cetera. You give it to the plant clearance officer who has 20 days to review and either accept or require correction of the list. You then have an opportunity where you can ask for purchasing the property. Let's say that there's leftover you know, government property at the end of your contract. You didn't use all the material you had to buy. You can't just take it, right? you may have to purchase it, and the purchase is at the unit cost at the time you acquired it. Unless there's some other thing that's going on, that's really how it normally works. If you had a grant, for example, the rules are slightly different, but here under the FAR, to purchase the property that has been acquired as part of government inventory under the life of the contract, you typically will be asked to pay the unit acquisition cost for what you paid under the contract. Um, you'll have to watch out for like handling fees, additional fees, no profit, nothing like that. The government would want to get unit acquisition costs. To return the unused property at the fair market value 
and get a credit to the contract, less a restocking fee that you could do. To use the property on another contract, again, you have to add that into your inventory schedule, requesting that it be removed from the inventory schedule and that you, again, execute forms in order to transfer the property with the contracting officer's approval under the current contract and with the contracting officer's approval under the new contract so the property goes there. Or to continue using the government property again, that has to be with the permission of the property administrator as well as the contracting officer. Next slide. This is a picture of the SF-1423. Uh, it's an inventory verification survey. And as you can see, it asks you to basically say all the things that we talked about. What's the condition of this property? How much is it? Where is it? Et cetera. And there are other forms as well, but I just wanted you to see a lot of these forms are very detailed and you need to make sure you're filling them out accurately. A failure to fill out a form accurately, you're certifying that it is accurate, could lead to them saying that there's a false claim. Uh, false claims are not good and can lead to repercussions, uh, both fines, penalties, and damages. So you really want to be accurate in how you're handling this equipment this material, this property, and you want to be accurate in any certifications that you're finding. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I said before, the plant clearance officer addresses reutilization of the property where um, the contract ends. So there's two other pieces of this process, which is if they want to reutilize the property, it's because they've decided they don't want to abandon the property, meaning they have no longer got a use for it, and they might want to abandon it in place at the contractor location, or they might want to abandon it and require that the government do something. Destruction criteria, FAR 45603, that basically deals with things where you might have something that could be um, requiring demilitarization. You know, like let's say that you've got um, you've been doing a government contract, and the contract is for doing arms, armaments, um, rockets, fuel, something. And then at the end of the contract, you've got some extra stuff, and the government says, you know, this stuff was jet fuel, military grade jet fuel. You need to demilitarize it. You can't resell it. You can't do this. You can't do that. There are specific criteria for how you demilitarize and how you destroy that property. Um, so you'll have to really pay attention to that. You could be asked where there is this property that the government wants to use it. The priority is that it gets reused by the same agency because it's been paid for by that agency. The funding, that color of money has been apportioned and allotted to that agency. If you want to transfer it to a different agency, then it's going to probably go to the General Services Administration, which is in charge of reuse and donation of surplus property, that government property. Otherwise, there also is an option where the property might be sent to a nonprofit for an educational purpose or to a school. Sometimes, you know, we send excess computers to schools so that they can use those things. Um, that's a typical use of government property at the end of a contract where the contractor no longer has a need for it and doesn't want to buy it and the government no longer has a need for it and then they may use it for a public purpose somewhere else. Next slide. So when isn't government property required to go to the GSA? This is a list. Um, they'll identify those things where it's going to be abandoned, it's going to be destroyed, it says here, property furnished to NAF activities, that's non-appropriated fund activities. For example, a non-appropriated fund instrumentality could be you know, a Navy um, market where, or the Army Air Force Exchange where they sell different services. They might send the property there. We have leftover computers. You don't need them anymore. Maybe the NAF needs them. That could be something that potentially they could dispose of without having to go through GSA. Uh, scrap, we talked about scrap before. That, except for aircraft scrap, which does have to get tracked, scrap could be something that gets disposed of without having to go through GSA. Uh, perishables, things that perishables, hazardous waste, controlled substances, 
dangerous things, those are things that aren't going to go through GSA because of exigency, timing, or special needs to handle those things. As it says at the bottom, nuclear materials, for example, need to be disposed of in accordance with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, applicable state licensing and federal regulations. So those don't go through GSA. Those will be overseen by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Next slide. So when you're dealing with government property at the end of the contract, there's standard screening. You remember you filled out those forms, you've given those forms to the property man, man, manager. The property manager is working in conjunction with the contracting officer and the contracting agency the first 20 days to decide, do we need this government property anymore? Is there another location within the agency or outside it that we could transfer it to? Should we donate it? Or can we just abandon it? Or do we need to ask them, direct them to destroy it? Days 21 through 46, that's after the agency has decided, gee, I don't need this anymore. It might go to GSA, right? And so GSA goes and it's screening. Do other agencies need this? Is this something that I could transfer or donate? At, at the end of day 46, and again, maybe it happens earlier, but typically, um, by day 46, GSA then will say, I have identified a purpose. I've identified what I'm going to do with it. So during days 42 to 46, that's where GSA makes the allocation to send this, arrange for the transfer or donation of this property. There could be special screening processes separate and apart from this, depending upon what the property is, um, where property is being transferred outside of the agency that initially funded its acquisition, the agency receiving it will be responsible for paying the costs of that transfer. And it's very simple. They're going to get the benefit of it. So they're going to be the ones who are going to be asked to pay for it. Next slide. So where the inventory is processed, no reutilization is identified, meaning they're not going to transfer it to another agency. They're not going to transfer it to a nonprofit. The plant clearance officer may authorize abandonment or destruction of government property. Now, it says here it's property that has no commercial value, doesn't require demilitarization, and doesn't constitute a danger to public health and welfare. These last two, demilitarization, danger to public health and welfare, those need to be disposed of very specifically. But if it's something else, they can decide we're going to abandon it. Abandon it means they have to have a higher level authority uh, clearing it above the plant clearance officer. So they may authorize donation of the property at no cost to the government. They may send unsold surplus property to another place to go. Um, there will be a public notice. If you go into the Federal Register, you'll see it. Um, happens every so often, public notice of, you know, like we're transferring this property. And basically that's there so that people who see it may say, ah, oh, I have a need for this, or, oh, it's going to this entity. I'm another entity. I want that instead. You might want to ask for it. And so the public notice provision is in there in the Federal Management Regulation 102.36.330 is the one that governs that public exception and public notice. Next slide. So the FMR also, as I said, governs the sale of surplus property. The sale may occur through a GSA sales center. GSA, in addition to the federal supply schedule, is responsible for you know, basically you know, all of the property. So GSA, Government Services Agency, handles all the property. It handles buildings, it handles property. Uh, the proceeds of any sale are gonna be credited to Treasury, as we said earlier, unless there's a statute that says it goes somewhere else. The plant clearance officer is required to prepare these uh, disposal reports, that SF 1424, in order to account for all the property, any changes in quantity, the value, and any loss. Scrap needs to be disposed of effectively, efficiently, and properly, and in a documented procedure. If you have scrap, this is a little fill up here, even though it's scrap, 
you have to segregate it into different kinds of scrap. Why? Probably because you have aluminum, you have magnesium, you have steel. They all will need to get disposed of differently. And so you want to be um, disposing of them and segregating them so that when you send it off, only the stuff that is of that type that has that kind of disposition goes and the other stuff goes to the different places where it may need to be done. In addition, absent contract terms, government contract, the government may decide to abandon parts. Let's say I'm doing maintenance, I'm swapping out a battery, putting in a new battery. The government may decide they're going to abandon that battery at the location where you, the contractor, are performing that maintenance service. There, interestingly, could be costs to this. And the question is whether those costs get paid by the government. They're abandoning this property. They are not planning on paying for it. So this could be a cost that you really need to be tracking and and uh, accounting for if you're going to bid on a contract that's going to have that kind of abandonment. So something definitely to be thinking about. Next slide. If it's a modification, by the way, um, that might be something that you include in the cost of a modification that you negotiate. It might be a, a price change order, and then you would want to account for it. But otherwise, if they just decide to do that during the course of the contract, um, they may say, we're not paying for it. Title to government property and administration clauses. These are the three clauses, and we'll talk very briefly about these clauses. Next slide. So 52.245-1 is the traditional government property clause. Uh, I've identified it's a very long clause. I only identified parts of it here. The one I wanted to focus on was the contractor liability for government property, saying that one, remember we talked about the contractor is not liable for loss of government property, except for the following. So if you have insurance, Right, And in some of these contracts, many of them says, contractor, you must have insurance up to X amount of dollars, whatever. If you have insurance, then you may be liable to have that insurance pay for that loss. And then the amount above that, that then would be something assumed by the government unless they have found that they have uh, with, revoked that assumption of the risk of loss. So again, this can get complicated really need to work with the government uh, to try and make sure that you're not prejudicing the government's rights to seek recovery against any third parties for any loss of government property and um, address all of these different pieces of tracking, tracing, and who pays for what and the liability as part of this whole process. Um, it says here at the end, upon the request of the contracting officer, the contractor shall at the government's expense furnish the government reasonable assistance and cooperation, including prosecution of the suit and execution of instruments of assignment in favor of the government in obtaining cover recovery, where in fact there may be that opportunity to seek recourse against the third party. So something to, again, just keep in mind. Next slide. This other clause, this is another part of 245. Actually, I think you just went over, go back. Yeah, that's it. Um, 245-1, which is equitable adjustment. Remember I said, if there's a change in the contract, something different has happened, you may very well be able to recover it under the changes clause. One of the carve outs, however, is the government shall not be liable for a breach of contract for any delay in delivery of government property, delivery of government property in a condition not suitable for its intended use, an increase or decrease in substitution of government property, or failure to repair or replace. However, they still could be liable under a changes clause for financial remuneration, but they, you can't raise a breach of contract that the entire purpose of the contract is no longer valid, but you could seek recompense under the changes clause. A little twist, but something good to know. Alternate two, which is at the very bottom, is much more like the grant rules, which is if that alternate is in there, then title to the property purchased with funds available for research and having a cost of less than 5,000 will vest in the contractor and not the government after acquisition. So just a little twist on this over here, if you have that clause, that's one of the twists. Next slide. 
So 52245-2 is government property installation operation services. Key here is where you have this clause, you're getting this government property as is. It's in whatever condition it is, wherever it happens to be. There's no warranties of suitability for use or purpose. Remember, we talked about government furnished property. When it's government furnished property, there are these, these guarantees that, in fact, it's going to be suitable for purpose, use, quantity, etc. Here, where you have this clause, as is, where is, that's all the government's responsible for. There could be real costs, as you see in C, unless the contracting officer determines otherwise, the government abandons all rights entitled to unserviceable and scrap property resulting from contract performance. And upon notification by the contracting officer, the contractor shall remove such property from the government premises and dispose of it at contractor expense. So there could be real costs in having this government property and then having to get rid of it at the end. So remember I talked about demilitarization and other things. Those are not things that are done for free and those are not things that may be easy. And so you could be, let's say you want to dispose of batteries. Maybe you just can't take it to the local dump and drop it there. You know, maybe it's not something they're going to accept unless it's been otherwise treated. So you really need to be thinking about this clause and what are the repercussions of it. On the other hand, if you have scrap, the scrap may very well have some value for remelting. You know, maybe you can remelt it and reuse it. Um, so this is a clause that you just have to read the clause uh, and really be careful if it's in your contract to know what it could put you on the hook for and address that. Next slide. So key takeaways. Different rules and requirements apply depending upon the kind of contract and the type of government property you have. Uh, there is differences. I know we didn't have a lot of time today, but fixed price, cost reimbursements, slightly different rules. If you go and you look at FAR Part 45, you'll see there are slightly different rules. So depending upon the kind of contract, if it's research and development, if it's a supplies contract, if it's some other kind of contract, there could be different rules. Review your solicitation carefully to determine what you can expect with regard to government property. And when you're handling it, be sure that you have a property management plan and program in place and that you're going to follow it. Make sure you document your actions and you track those requirements carefully because in handling government property, the devil is in the details. Next slide. So if you have any questions or you just want to ask me a question about this material, please don't hesitate to call me. You can reach me at that email, susan.ebner at stinson.com, or you can go onto the Stinson website and find my other contact information. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Susan, for such an informative presentation, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. As mentioned, you can always catch the recording on our YouTube channel within 24 hours, and you'll find over 600 webinars on government contracting there. That's it for today's webinar. Thank you again, Susan, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Emma. Have a great day. You too.